Welcome to Blind Spots, a podcast where we're helping you fill the gap between what you want to do with your money and what you actually do. We are professional investors, writers, and financial planners helping you navigate the complexities of finance to optimize what you can control and cut out the rest. Join your host, Nick Shermans and Aaron Varghese, as we discuss the questions and nuances surrounding everyday money management. Investment advisory services offered through Pure Portfolios, a registered investment advisor with the U.S. Securities and Exchange Commission. Nick Shermans and Aaron Varghese work for Pure Portfolios. Any opinions expressed by Nick and Aaron or any podcast guest are solely their own opinions and do not reflect the opinions of Pure Portfolios. This podcast is for informational purposes only and should not be relied upon for investment decisions. It should not be construed as legal or tax advice and is not intended to replace the advice of a qualified attorney or tax professional. Clients of Pure Portfolios may maintain positions and securities discussed in this podcast. This information is not an offer or solicitation to buy or sell securities. The information contained may have been compiled from third-party sources and is believed to be reliable. Hello, everyone, and welcome back to the Blind Spots podcast. As the end of the year arrives and the new year is upon us, our news feeds are going to be filled with market forecasts for the year ahead of us. So in this week's episode of Blind Spots, we are going to be discussing the problem with Wall Street forecasts and why market predictions can just be noise. So Nick, you've written about this topic every single year since, what, 2016? Yeah, and there are certain things you can set your watch to. Like this is one of my favorite times of the year. I have three kids. We're in full Christmas mode. I enjoy eating like a pig and having a cocktail and spending time with my family, but I also really get a kick out of these Wall Street forecasts. I really enjoy tracking what they say. So most of these forecasts come out in December and they're projecting the next year's S&P target or what happens in the economy, what happens with inflation, what happens with interest rates. There's everything under the sun is fair game for them to forecast. And by them, I mean Wall Street. And I'm an investment nerd, so I always go back. Like one of my favorite things to do, and this is going to sound odd, but but I'll go back to like December of 2006, December of 2007, and read what every major Wall Street bank was saying about 2008. And of course, the bottom fell out of the housing market. There was a financial crisis. It was the worst financial crisis uh, since the Great Depression. But if you read the forecasts, market will go up by 10% next year. Nothing to see here. I mean, they were so wrong. It wasn't even funny. Now, now I'm, I'm not saying it's easy to, to predict. In fact, it's quite impossible as, as we'll shortly see, but some of these elaborate smart sounding forecasts can be so ridiculous. It's almost like a, a drama or like a, a satire comedy when you look back and compare what they say versus what actually happened. So what makes you so passionate about this or why did this make it onto your calendar of things that you set your watch to? Well, it, it reminds me of, of the drunk uncle that I have. I'm not saying that I have, but a drunk (laughs) uncle during, (laughs) during a holiday dinner or something that is just hell bent. He knows what's going to happen next year. The market's going to tank. The market's going to do this. The economy is going to do that. And then the next year. They completely forget about what they said the previous year, and they have something new that they're on, or they just keep repeating the same thing that didn't happen. (laughs) Wall Street is just like that. And the media feeds into this. Investors consume this content, and it's like this big machine. And I've I've said this before, but if you you turn on CNBC, none of the guests say things like, the market's going to ebb and flow over the next 10 years, but it's probably going to be higher. Like, no one says that because it's boring. You come off as aloof. You might even come off as an idiot. But if you weave into this, if if you go on CNBC and talk about doomsday or a smart sounding prediction about inflation or interest rates or what have you, you sound like a sage. You sound intelligent and people just eat it up. So what about these, like you said, these, these crazy predictions, these things that are really on the extremes, you know, no one's, like you said, going to say that. The market's just going to ebb and flow. It's going to be normal. That's boring, right? So why do people gravitate so heavily towards these forecasts? Well, there's a few things going on here. First on the Wall Street side. One, Wall Street will mostly always predict stock prices are going to increase the following year. So there's an institutional bullish bias because they don't want their clients to pull their money, right? And if you think about it from the extreme end, if you walked into your Morgan Stanley advisor, I'm not picking on Morgan Stanley, but they, they told you, hey, the market's going to drop by 50% next year. You would probably sell all your stocks and pull out of the stock market and they wouldn't collect their fees. 
So know that Wall Street is always going to be optimistic. The second thing there is historically markets have an upward bias. Over time, going back the last 80 to 100 years, the markets go up by six or 7% a year. So with that in mind, it's a safe forecast to predict the market's going to go up by X amount per, per year. So that's what Wall Street kind of leans into. On the investor side, on the consumer of information side, there's a human psychology component where humans like certainty. We don't like uncertainty. Wall Street plays to this. And even if it's BS, humans like the illusion of control. We, we like to feel like we're in control, especially about things like money. That's, that's yeah. tied to our well-being, the safety of our family, our future. So, so we like a sense of certainty and Wall Street provides that through their rosy predictions. I mean, like you alluded to, I, I've wrote about this uh, for five years. I followed it for much longer, but I can count on one hand the number of times a big Wall Street firm has come out and said the following year's market returns are going to be negative. And you had a situation that we thought was a little bit odd where a client brought to your attention this article that was written by a larger Wall Street firm. That did kind of have that doom and gloom kind of prediction. Yeah. And this is the problem that I have with predicting things. People act on it. Uninformed clients that don't know any better act on these forecasts and that, and that could be a bad thing. And I still can't believe this, this big firm did this, but they basically said investors should sell all of their U S bonds and all of their U S stocks in 2022, because European stocks and Japanese stocks are going to perform better. And they quoted all these smart sounding reasons why, but about how irresponsible that is and the Pandora's box that it opens up. So one, most of our, our client that asked us this questions, assets were in a taxable account. Okay. A non-retirement account. Given the last 12 years of mostly gains with, with stocks, those positions, those assets had a large unrealized gain. If, if they heeded this advice, they, they would have blown out of everything and been saddled with a monster tax bill. So that's, that's not very responsible. Two, this investor was a, a balanced investor, meaning roughly they had 60% stocks and 40% bonds. Morgan Stanley was basically advocating for a hundred percent exposure to equities, which would have been reckless. Even if we assume we mirror the 60, 40 portfolio and just sub out us assets and sub in Europe and Japanese stocks and bonds, those bond yields are much lower than U.S. bond yields. So, so I struggled to understand how they would be better off from that, from that approach. And lastly, let's say they executed this trade and acted on this advice. I mean, is this a, is this a three month thing? Is this a six month thing? Is it a long-term shift to European stocks and Japanese stocks? I mean, what if the trade went against you? It, it, it's just, it just, I, I, I think it's a bit reckless to say things like that. And on the consumer side, it's even more reckless to act on that advice, but I've seen it time and again, and people do it. Well, it's a lot to hang your hat on for a firm to say something like that. But again, there, there's no repercussions for them mm -hmm. to put out things like that because they, they're not held accountable for that client's personal assets. You know, it, it's all up to the discretion of whoever's reading it. And I think you're, you're exactly right and make a fair point. That that's designed to get people like us to talk about it. And it was mission accomplished because it was carried across Bloomberg and CNBC, all the major financial outlets carried this forecast. And that's how our client got it. And think about the millions of other people that got that. And God forbid, I, I hope they didn't act on that. It doesn't even matter if the forecast that this big bank is right or wrong. What matters is that's a broken process. That's the wrong way to go about things. Just changing your allocation based on the uh, whims of some major Wall Street bank. Yeah, there's a lot to be said about the name recognition and how much trust goes into just seeing a, a well-known name. So it's, I mean, it's kind of dangerous for clients who see things like that. I would argue if a client did that and it worked out, that would be the worst outcome because they would do it again, again, and again. And the more times you make those large active decisions, the more likely mm -hmm. you are to be wrong and make a huge mistake. Yeah. So. Moving back to the annual forecast kind of topic, we've talked about these forecasts, of course, that Wall Street firms aren't making. So you would think that there is some sort of process or if there's a standard that these forecasts are being made, they must be correct or close to correct some of the time, right? 
So, so let's focus on the most popular forecasts. So the charade goes, all these major banks predict what the S and P index level or index price will be at the end of 2022. So they're making these predictions now, and they're saying on December 31 of 2022, this is going to be the S and P indexes price. All right. On average, Wall Street misses their consensus prediction targets by 13%. So if, if you think about what the long-term stock market return average is, let's just call it 7%. Wall Street is basically saying, based on their error rate, that the market is going to be either down 6% or up 20% based on their prediction history, which is a pretty wide range. I yeah. mean, think about... Any job out there, you can name any job, if you were wrong by, by that amount, like, like you probably would be unemployable. I mean, it's even worse than the weatherman or the weather person. <laughs> that, that's a huge error rate. But to, to your point, Aaron, that, that doesn't stop them from trying. Like, like they show up every December with this renewed vigor and sense of, of what happens next. They dust off their crystal ball and they're more confident and have more hubris than ever. And it's, it's amazing to me, someone with a, a track record a futility can be that confident in their forecast. So I'm going to ask you to explain it like I'm five years old. So if I had a portfolio that was $100,000, give me the range of outcomes that that forecast might, with the margin of error of about 13%, give me what that range of outcome could potentially be. Right. So if you plunked 100K into the S&P 500 on 1-1 one, one of 2022, based on Wall Street's error rate, they're telling you that you're either gonna have $94,000 at the end of 2022 or $120,000 at the end of 2022. That's the well, rate. The, the 120 sounds pretty good, but the 94 doesn't. So I guess I hope that they're right on the upside. Well, it's, I mean, I don't really have any words. Like people are starting to pick up on this though. And many advisors that I follow that are on the independent side you know, we kind of poke fun at this and it's becoming more mainstream that Wall Street really doesn't have a clue. And and when you look at their forecast for 2022, I kind of chuckled at this because this tells me they have no clue what's going to happen. And I'm not pretending to know what happens next either, but I'm not out there in public making forecasts. Wall Street is predicting a 7% return for the S&P 500, which is the long-term historical average. History has shown, like if you go back and chart the last 100 years of S&P returns or 80 years that the index has been a lot, the index rarely achieves a 7% return on the number. Some years it might do better, some years it might do worse, but the frequency of returns of actually landing on 7% is actually quite rare. So for them to predict that tells me that they have no clue what happens next. That's their, that's their way of saying they have no clue what happens next. I feel like 7% is kind of like that magic number. Like that's everyone's favorite number. It just sounds nice. And 7% is when you... Talk to someone about average market return, 7%, I think is often thrown out. Maybe it's just kind of well, a nice number to hear. I mean, it kind of reminds me of the function in Excel where you can like click the bottom right of the box and just drag it to the right. And it assumes mm -hmm. like the formula is going off the long-term average in this case, it's 7%. Like that, that's kind of what they're doing. And, and one thing I want to point out too, Wall Street's horrible record is during a non-pandemic time, right? Like we're not talking about a perpetual pandemic where randomness happens. The last pandemic we had was the Spanish flu of 1913 or something like that. So their record is in a quote unquote normal time. Imagine trying to pretend you know what happens next in a pandemic. And a perfect example is what happened the day after Thanksgiving where we were cruising along nicely. I mean, September was a little noisy. October was a little hairy. The day after Thanksgiving, when most people are, are rolling out of bed with a turkey hangover, the market was going to hell in a handbasket because of this random variant in South Africa. Okay. There's no way you could forecast that. Yeah. So why, so why even try? Yeah. I think it was maybe five o'clock and I was just kind of scrolling through my newsfeed and I was like, what happened? And I was like, really just Omicron? Like, is that really what we're talking about now? Yeah. So like, unless you can predict various variants and i don't even want to go down this path because i would butcher the language because i'm not a doctor but i mean if you can if you can predict the the evolution of a of a virus that no one really knows where it came from across billions of people around the world then i then i guess have at it and make some forecasts but that was a prime example of why 
your portfolios does not make forecasts in a normal environment, we sure as hell are, are not, are not going to try to make forecasts in a global pandemic. So I'll come back to why we don't make forecasts in a little bit, but what things should people be aware of when reading these forecasts? We've gone over it a little bit, but I want your quick and dirty list of what to look at, what to think about. I can say that you can consume these forecasts if you like smart sounding narratives, but look at it through a lens of entertainment. Like don't, don't take it serious. Don't act on it. Don't think it's actionable advice. Look through it with just a, a light, uh, light curiosity and think of it as entertainment. And if you really want to get deep in the weeds on this, again, I've written about this for the last five years, you can catch it on the blog, but go back and look at some of the forecasts from, from any single year and compare it to what actually happened. And it's, it's actually pretty fun to do. And it's quite amusing how bad some of these forecasts are. Yeah. So maybe this is redundant, but at the end of every blog post that you've written that is titled Tis the Season for Wall Street Forecasts, we have uh, part five up on the Peer Portfolios blog now. But you say that Peer Portfolios is proudly forecast free since 2016. So going all the way back to 2016, the genesis of Peer Portfolios, why did you decide that you are not going to be a forecast friendly firm? Because I'm an evidence-based investor. History has shown that even the brightest minds on planet earth cannot predict complex systems and human behavior and how investors' appetites for risk will change and how investors will react to certain news. And I think there's countless examples of people trying to forecast and it turning out poorly. I mean, look, if the brightest mind, and I'm not saying Wall Street is stupid. There's some very smart people that work in Wall Street. If, if the brightest minds on planet Earth can't predict what happens next, what makes me think that I can do it or anyone else can do it? So I tend to think in probabilities and looking at market history. I mean, you can set your watch to this about 75 to 80 percent of the time markets melt higher, right? About 15 percent of the time markets go down about 5 percent of the time. Things get really weird, like 2008 and 2020. So if we think in probabilities, if we build a portfolio that reflects the way that we feel about risk, that gives us the best chance of success. All of the other crap that we're talking about, forecasts, making these huge, huge active shifts from stocks to cash and back, empirically, evidence shows that they do not work. Yeah, I think that's really great advice for that person who really craves to know always what's going to happen in the future is to... One, look at forecasts as entertainment and two, be evidence-based, think kind of logically through things and know that if you are invested correctly and understand your acceptable range of outcomes, then you'll be fine. Yeah. So, so quit asking, like people ask me this, Nick, what does your crystal ball say about next year? It's like, don't, don't even fall into that. That that's the wrong mindset. Like you are susceptible to Outside noise, you don't have an information filter. You're, you're still trying to figure out if someone knows what happens next. No one knows what happens next. So quit asking that question. And it's always followed up by that little like chuckle and a nudge, nudge, because right. they know it's a funny question. Right. Like, like if you want these smart sounding predictions that are wrong, like turn on Bloomberg TV, turn on CNBC, read, read, read Yahoo Finance. And, and if you like that exercise, if you just like to hear different viewpoints, that's one thing. But if you're constantly craving this stuff, you're probably going to act on it and you probably have the wrong mindset. This is one of my favorite things to write about and talk about. I might seem like I'm piling on Wall Street, but I just don't want anyone to act on it. Like that, that that's where the genesis of my passion and spirit comes from is I really don't want people to act on some of these loose and incorrect forecasts. So we've decided to highlight a bad actor of the week. So why are we doing a bad actor of the week? Because. Our biggest problem at Pure Portfolios is that most people, not all, but most of the general population thinks all advisors are the same. And that might've been true in the eighties and the nineties, and maybe even for the first part of the two thousands, but it's not true today. And it's a dangerous conclusion. And that's why we've done a lot to write about how we would vet an advisor things you need to look out for, things that might fly under the radar that aren't so obvious to help people make better decisions, even if it's not with peers. So we're not plugging peer portfolios, but there's 
so many differences between non-fiduciary advisors, insurance person, salesperson, working for a publicly traded company, working for an independent company, working for a broker dealer. We, we live in this world every day and it's confusing. It's designed to confuse the, the SEC, a lot of the regulatory bodies could, could do much to make it an easier process and to identify conflicts of interest, but they don't, they make it more confusing because big companies with their lobbyists are throwing piles of cash at this every single year, just because the current setup is so good for wall street. It's so good for public companies, not so good for the consumer. And they want to keep it that way. Yes. So the bad actor of this week is an ex Merrill Lynch financial advisor who is facing charges of fraud and money laundering in connection with allegedly fleecing current and prospective clients out of more than $1 million. So this person solicited business from a couple who wishes to stay unnamed, apparently had a relationship with them where he managed their money at another firm. So each of them with this couple sent more than $500,000 to purportedly invest in bonds that are backed by homeowners association fees or HOA fees. So this couple was told that he could beat any rate of return that they were receiving currently, and he could do it all without any market risk at all. So the he advisor up was telling this nice couple, he could beat yes. any rate of return, red flag number one, you can't say yeah. that, and doing so with no risk, red flag number two. So if you watch American Greed, which, which I do, and I always curse the poor victims because these red flags, these two that we just highlighted are consistent. Every Ponzi scheme, every fraud, every bad actor talked about guaranteeing a rate of return. I can beat Illegal. any rate of return and Illegal. I can do so with little risk. That doesn't exist, folks. That's fairy tale stuff. Don't fall for it. Please continue. This advisor actually ended up making some payments back to the couple that he falsely represented as quarterly distributions, but rather than actually investing the money, he spent it on credit card bills, a luxury car, and paying some golf club fees. So he, again, has now been charged with wire fraud, investment advisor fraud, and money laundering, and if convicted, faces up to 20 years in prison. I hope this clown never works around money again. And I hope he goes away for a long time because this is egregious. And there's a couple of things. One, one, I highlighted the, the two major red flags that are consistent with every fraud and Ponzi scheme, but two, notice this, this person worked for a large wall street bank. And you might think that stuff doesn't happen at a large wall street bank, but I can tell you there's no system compliance regulatory rule that can catch and filter out human greed, a bad actor's going to be able to operate under any umbrella. And I'm glad they caught this guy or gal. So there are a lot of systems in place to prevent this kind of thing from happening. But if a client is talking with their advisor and kind of like you said, red flag number one is guaranteeing a certain amount of return, obviously something to stay away from. What are other red flags that likely happened in this situation that this couple could have avoided? Because I've got one in mind. Please share. When thinking about how this person actually got money into their own hands, right? Like our clients don't write checks to us personally. Like no one's writing a check to Aaron, right? Because I can't deposit a check that's made out to Pure Portfolios or to Charles Schwab in my personal bank account. So that's one area where I feel like this couple could have really steered clear of is if you're wiring money to a personal bank account or writing a check to a physical person know that that money is not safe. Well, and, and it's against the law too. So right. legally registered investment advisors like pure and many others, we can't custody client assets, right? Even if a client writes us a check to go in their Charles Schwab account, we can't hold it for more than 24 hours. So we like have physical to get those funds <laughs> and move them into the custodian custodians like Schwab and fidelity, their primary job in this whole operation is to safeguard client assets from bad actors like this. What Aaron's talking about is this guy or gal had these clients write a check to him, his own personal bank account. That's, that is another red flag. And, and look, we're, we're not doing this to pile on to wall street, even though I, I enjoy doing that because they make it so easy. We're, we're doing this. So people avoid these mistakes in the future, because there is some egregious red flags and hopefully with with our help, you can avoid falling into one of these pitfalls. Yeah. So that was our bad actor of the week. 
there's a lot yeah. more where this came from too. Because my inbox, I've I, I've got a list of like fifty of these. I'm I'm consistently blitzed with bad actors, and it's it's more prevalent than people think. It's not on front page news because it happens so much. Yeah. Well, all of our previous Tis the Season for Wall Street Forecast blogs will be linked below, so you can check that out over the years. And we will see you in our next episode. 